Hey, thanks for um, chilling with Kuzo. Um, I think we learned a history today. Not like a lot of it, but like, you know, I think this is one of the things that I kind of want to learn. I don't know. I'm just thinking. Eventually, we'll get into it. I'm learning about something that I, you know, that I feel like some people know, but not everybody. That's for later. But right now, I'm going to watch, just like everybody else, the destruction of Diddy. So, let's get into it. Taking a little minute, god damn. Hold on. There we go. I didn't know I could do that. Jeez, come on. You see? I don't know what's up with like um and like many other instances over the last three decades, it looked like he was that. once again going to be getting off the hook. After all, this is an extremely rich and powerful man who people have from alleged the start, was please, doing dirty, please, disgusting from things the in the start. background for quite some time. And he was still a staple in the entertainment and computer. business sector of our world. I like when you like this, Daddy. Daddy, when you put my back Daddy I like when you, when you right scrambling and scraping. No, 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 hold no, on, like hold that. on. Hey, yo, hey, yo. Hold up. Hold Damn, you want to play the no diddy part so bad. I said start and like from the many top. other instances over so many so at this point it has been over two months since diddy began to self-destruct on the morning of march 25th the world watched on as the walls began to be knocked down diddy's la and miami mansions had both been raided by the feds and we're still trying to figure out where exactly e diddy is located is there any sense of how long that could take after a raid like this it could take weeks, it could take months. And the reason why is because they gathered so much evidence was supposedly they gathered so many videos and laptops and also electronic devices. And they have to now conduct a forensic investigation of those items. Videos of Diddy pacing back and forth went public and it was even rumored that he was hiding out overseas. Since then, things have definitely quieted down on the Diddy front. He had apparently returned back home. People had even seen him out in public. And like many other instances over the last three decades, it looked like he was once again going to be getting off the hook. Mm. After all, this is an extremely rich and powerful man who people have alleged was doing dirty, disgusting things in the background for quite some time. And he was still a staple in the entertainment and business sector of our world. Yeah, I like when you like this, Daddy. Yeah, when you put my bag Daddy, yeah, I like when you, when you right scrambling right and right scraping. No, 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 I, got I no like that. You know, I, I remember him saying that. Birthday, that crazy I ass shit. Mean, I remember that, bro. Birthday before. You came to my party. You know? No, but me and you ain't never really party. You know what I'm saying? P. Diddy be wanting to party. And you got to tell him no. But now it looks like we might finally be getting just a little party, peek man. behind the curtain into the dark world of Diddy. As a surveillance video has now been leaked, and this apparently comes from the raid of his home from two months back, where you can see him physically violating his ex-girlfriend Cassie Ventura in a hotel hallway back in 2016. Diddy appears here in a towel, and he continually throws her around like a rag doll as she attempts to escape. The scene That's here is good. truly disturbing and really does make you think about what this man would be willing to do behind closed doors. When it comes to these two, they actually dated for over a decade, and you can only imagine the things she saw during that time period. After this all came out, he would actually release a garbage apology video. It's so difficult to reflect on 
the darkest times in your life, sometimes you got to do that. I was f***ed up. I mean, I hit rock bottom. But I make no excuses. My behavior on that video is inexcusable. I take full responsibility for my actions in that video. I'm disgusted. I was disgusted then when I did it. I'm disgusted now. When I um, I'm more pretty like blowed because I don't know, bro. Why, why do the apology? Why do the apology, though? This, this shit is unnecessary. This shit's so unnecessary, dog. What the fuck? Because, first of all, I'm not saying that he shouldn't, like, you know, because he was wrong, but come on, bro. You did much more dirty shit. Come on, man. Dirtier shit. Come on. And then I sought out professional help. I had to go into therapy, I'm going to rehab. I had to ask God for his mercy and grace. I'm so sorry. I'm not asking for forgiveness. Truly sorry. And sadly, due to the statute of limitations, apparently Diddy cannot be tried for his actions that day. And of course, this incident is actually one of many that was presented in Cassie's lawsuit against P. Diddy that she filed last November, where she sought damages over trafficking, physical violation, and physical abuse. And this suit would actually be settled out of court only one day after it was filed. And while she was seeking $30 million, there is no official number on where they would eventually settle. Of the many things Cassie would accuse Diddy of, the list would include violated Miss Ventura in her own home after she tried to leave him, often punched, beat, kicked, and stomped on Miss Ventura, resulting in bruises, burst lips, black eyes, and bleeding, blew up a man's car after he learned that he was romantically interested in Miss Ventura, and that was allegedly Kid Cuddy whose car he blew. Okay, see, I remember that. I remember that. But this shit here, bro. Leave that, like, just leave the lady alone. Why can't, that's my whole thing. Like, man, please. She, if she want to leave, let her leave, bro. Please. Like, enough, enough of DV. Enough of this domestic violence shit, bro. Enough of it. We've been, Jesus Christ, man. Niggas be, been beating women forever. Like, chill, dog. Like, this shit ain't cool. This shit really, like, this shit really trash. Like, let's be honest. Like, we know we stronger than them. And, and y'all still, like, y'all still hit them? Like, knowing you stronger? Like, knowing that you can really, really, like, hurt this person that you claim you love at a point? Think about that. Like, look how stupid that shit sound. You really use your manly strength on a woman. That don't sound like a little, like, that don't sound a little soft to you. It don't, um, you know, maybe I'm just speaking for real. Well, forced Miss Ventura to engage in sex with male workers while dating and filming the encounters, ran out of... So he's a cuck. So did he's a cuck. Okay. His apartment with a firearm in pursuit of a rivalry industry executive whom he learns was nearby. This was allegedly Suge Knight. Demanded that Miss Ventura to carry his firearm in her purse just to make her uncomfortable and demonstrate how dangerous he is. And introduced Miss Ventura to a lifestyle of excessive alcohol and substance abuse and required her to procure illicit prescriptions to satisfy his own addictions. These two mm. actually met back in 2005 when Cassie was only 19 years old. Apparently she got on his radar when he heard her first single playing in the club and immediately became interested in signing her with his label Bad Boy Records. I start, started hearing this record that was haunting me in the clubs and it was, you know, it, it was um, Cassie's record, me and me. And, um... Everybody low-key look shook everybody low-key little scared or am i tripping and it was, it was i would hear it everywhere i was at and so i kept asking who what record is that and when so it was my impact it was cast at that time, Diddy was a wealthy 37-year-old business mogul with the Midas touch, as he was known for his keen ability to spot out and shine light on the next big thing in music. 
he quickly rose up the ranks as the most powerful public figure in the hip-hop industry. Mr. Combs asserted complete control over Miss Ventura's personal and professional life, thereby ensuing her inability to escape his hold. He provided unprecedented avenues of success for the aspiring artist, but in return demanded obedience, loyalty, and silence. Within months of the two meeting, he would actually sign her to a 10-album deal, which in the music industry might as well be signing away a huge your portion life. of your career, as well as your life. I wanted, you know, Cassie to, um, um, everybody to meet Cassie. Y'all know that. And, um, here's a story directly from my mouth. Her debut album would... Ryan Leslie. Whatever happened to Ryan Leslie? Jesus Christ. ...be an immense success, climbing all the way up to the number four spot on the Billboard charts. What an artist. From here, she would be thrust into the spotlight of fame and everything that comes with it, a fast life of luxury that previously she could only dream of. Mr. Combs' recognition and glorification of Miss Ventura's naivety proved to set the groundwork for his manipulative and coercive romantic and sexual relationship with Miss Ventura, a woman nearly two decades his junior. Within a year of signing to Bad Boy Records, Mr. Combs became deeply entrenched in Miss Ventura's life, almost immediately asserting possession and control over her and inserting himself into all aspects of her career and personal life. And when Cassie first found out that Diddy was interested in her romantically, allegedly she was grossed out by the idea Due to his father-like relationship he had developed with her at the time, and of course the very large gap in their age. It would apparently take two years, but eventually Diddy would get his way and become intimate with Cassie. She would officially enter his inner circle, and soon Diddy would have his fingers on every aspect of her life. All aspects of Miss Ventura's life were controlled by Mr. Combs or his management companies. Every event Miss Ventura attended, from the travel to the makeup and clothing, was paid for directly by Mr. Combs and his affiliated companies. Just shooting this Cassie video. See if we can find Cassie. Compounding this all-encompassing intrusion into her life, Mr. Combs secured his control Hold over on, the young and impressionable Miss Ventura. Hold on, that shit pissed me off. I ain't gonna lie. When she shaved half her head, I was so mad. I ain't gonna lie. That shit pissed me the fuck off. That shit really pissed me off. Um, What the fuck, bro? Like, I, I was... Oh, like, see, part of me wonder if it was Diddy idea or her idea. I don't know. But stuff like that irritates me a lot. I don't like that shit at all. By introducing her to a drug-fueled lifestyle that kept her complacent and compliant, Mr. Combs first introduced Miss Ventura to be it's around 2008 and would often have pills and other drugs out in the open like candy. Upon information and belief, Mr. Combs has been addicted to prescription painkillers and took to see frequently. In this way, Mr. Combs exerted ownership over Miss Ventura. As another example of the ways in which he manipulated her, early on in their relationship, he asked her what she called her grandfather, and when Miss Ventura said that she referred to her grandfather as Pop Pop, Mr. Combs perversely insisted that she refer to him with that nickname. Now that is the move of a true weirdo. Over the next decade, multiple times each year, Niggas be so weird. That shit be so... Oh my god. Mr. Combs would oh, find Miss Ventura, leaving bruises on her body. After every instance in which he beat her, Mr. Com Wait, sorry, Combs sorry. used his money and power to orchestrate extensive efforts to hide the evidence of his abuse, including hiding Miss Ventura in hotels for days at a time to let her bruises heal. This is something that apparently happened time and time again. As the lawsuit does list multiple instances of Diddy putting his hands on Cassie, and even D That's what I'm saying, so like I'm- See, that's why I said, like, if it was his idea for her to shave half her head, that is fucked up. You know, it's already fucked up. But still, like, even did she shave her head as, like, a sign? You know what I'm saying? Like, it looked like paradise, but really is hell. You feel me? You got heaven on, but you know, with the hair, hell, and with no hair. You get what I'm saying? Like, that's what I'm thinking. But as many women did it. That shit ain't look good on everybody. Let's just say that. Details the network of people involved in covering these incidents up. She was allegedly kept away from family and was apparently even told to lie when questioned about these rumors of abuse. She found herself becoming numb to 
abuse she was experiencing and became entirely beholden to Mr. Combs' demands. She began to blindly follow his instructions out of fear of again being on the receiving end of a vicious beating. By Mr. Combs' own admission, his relationship with Miss Ventura was like Bobby and Whitney. A clear acknowledgement of the unequal power dynamic. Wait, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. How? You can't, you can't say that. Nope, you can't say that. They're not the same. I'm sorry. Yeah, that does, no. ...the relationship. Her volatile and abusive and Ventura was like Bobby and Whitney. A clear acknowledgement of the unequal power dynamic and excessive violence that permeated their relationship her vol okay so that's ike and tina turner that's not bobby and whitney bro it's not come on also a partner who also owns her label and therefore held her future success in his hands had fully exerted control over every aspect of her life that's not do you okay. believe in love at first sight i do yeah. i do was it love at first sight with your boyfriend it was a long time ago <laughs> 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 what makes you guys work? Um, well, I think what makes any relationship work, if it is working, is, you know, just not talking about it too much and just keeping it close to your heart. Furthermore, within months of the inception of their relationship, Cassie claims that Diddy was already shelling her out to other men for his own pleasure. While in New York City, Mr. Combs told Miss Ventura that he wanted to engage in a fantasy of his own called Vrism. Mr. Combs said it would turn him on if he saw Miss Ventura with another. Basically, she... That's fucking weird. Said no. Uh, you you niggas is weird. He's alleging that Diddy was in the corner watching. Mr. Combs began to call his arrangement a freak off or FO. He would repeatedly tell Miss Ventura at random moments that he wanted an FO. And Miss Ventura was eventually expected to facilitate the location and the hiring of the male workers. At certain points during Mr. Combs and Miss Ventura's relationship, he would insist on FO weekly. Mr. Combs would repeatedly tell Come, what the fuck you want, man? What the fuck? Hey, what he on, bro? This nigga did a, hey, bro. Mm. Nah, not lock his ass up, little freak ass nigga. He's 69. <laughs> lock this nigga up, man. What the fuck? Girl, lock Ventura this nigga this up. practice was our thing and our secret. FOs would often. I'm 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 blown, bro. I'm I'm blown. I'm blown. I'm so. Oh my god, this is this is bad boy, bad boy for life, bro. This this is what the fuck. I want to know exactly what he was doing to everybody at um, Junior Mafia. I need to know. Somebody got to do a background on that. Who? What was he doing to Junior Mafia? Because this is crazy. It didn't take place in hotel suites, including at the Trump International Hotel in Columbus Circle, a hotel in Beverly Hills, the London Hotel in Los Angeles, the Intercontinental Century City, the Intercontinental Atlanta, <laughs> The Intercontinental New York City. Is anyone seeing a pattern here? The Absolutely. One Hotel in New York and in Miami. The Mandarin Oriental Hotel in New York and in Miami. The Fontaine Blue in Miami. The Beverly Hills Hotel. And Shutters on the Beach in Los Angeles. On one occasion around 2013, Mr. Combs had an FO set up at the Intercontinental Hotel in New York City after which he was charged with tens of thousands of dollars in damages by the hotel. Upon information and belief, Mr. Combs' chief of staff, Tony Fletcher, paid the invoice charged by the hotel. Keep in mind, the lawsuit also claims that Diddy's personal assistants allegedly set up many of these encounters. And here is specifically the part where they talk about the hotel incident. So in or around know. March 2016, oh. during an FO at the Intercontinental Hotel in Century City, Los Angeles, Mr. Combs became extremely intoxicated and punched Miss Ventura in the face. After he fell asleep, she tried to leave the hotel room, but as she exited, Mr. Combs awoke and began screaming at her. He followed her into the hallway of the hotel while yelling at her. He grabbed at her and then took glass vases in the hallway and threw them at her, causing glass to crash around them as she ran to the elevator to escape. She managed to get into the elevator, and when she got to the lobby, quickly took a cab to her apartment. Upon realizing that her running away would cause Mr. Combs to be even angrier with her and completely stuck in his vicious cycle of abuse, Miss Ventura returned to the hotel with the intention of apologizing for running away from her. 
When she returned, hotel security staff urged her to get back into the cab and to go to her apartment, suggesting that they had seen the security footage showing Mr. Combs her and throwing glass at her in the hotel hallway. Upon information and belief, Mr. Combs paid the Intercontinental Century City $50,000 for the hallway security footage from that evening. And her that is fucking crazy. That is fucking... Yo, that's... Look, man. Look, man. I'm... I'm duh. Mm. I don't know, man. I, I don't know, man. Ah, <laughs> uh, money. Look, man. Money just magnify who people are. You know, and that boy got a lot of power, bro. Mm. They even told her to get back in the car. And they already seen the footage. This nigga came around and paid them to get rid of the footage. Or probably to be hush hush. Because, you know, nigga be like, yeah, I deleted it. The whole time they didn't. But still, like, this, this is something else. Mm. And what's crazy, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Because that's, that's not a pause, right? Okay. Um. Yeah, like. This is just the tip of the iceberg. This man has done so much damage. Oh my goodness. Well, I can't I can't wait for everything to just you know come out and then everybody see everything, you know? And I'm talking about not no allegations. I'm talking about the fact that like, you know, shit that's real. Proof and all. And remember, guys, that's the footage that they're saying is coming from this raid. So who knows what else they had? Who knows what else is going to leak? Of course, there's many other details of other that's incidents in this court filing. But if one thing is clear, it's that Cassie has PTSD from over a decade of the madness that went on with Diddy. Like for her to be so close to him for so long, I can only imagine the things that she went through and saw firsthand. And to me, she has to be the one person that Diddy likely fears the most when it comes to his inevitable downfall. And for him to go on this apology video acting like this was some sort of isolated incident is just ridiculous. To me, this is clearly a disgusting monster of a person who feels like he can do anything he wants to whoever he wants without fear of repercussions. Furthermore, there must be several people within his circle who are guilty in aiding him in his quest. Boy, that nigga, hey, I ain't gonna lie. This nigga right here, he was almost given You Rock My World. Michael Jackson video. Look at this shit. Furthermore, right here. there must That's be several crazy. people within his circle who are guilty and aid. Some of y'all niggas might be too young to know. Him in his quest for power over others. Of course, there are tens to hundreds of other rumors about this man that I plan to break down as more comes to light. I'm talking yep. about the Kardashians potentially being involved. I'm talking about him inviting the baby up to his room during the peak of his career that might have sparked those statements that he made on that Rolling Loud stage. I was at a party at Diddy crib. Diddy had he had put everybody else out the crib, like the the influx of people he had put him out. But he had he had a uh, he had took a, a liking to me in particular around the time, man. It was really you know what I mean, like putting his arm around me. Right. Either way, I will continue to keep you guys updated on the. What the fuck that mean? What the fuck that mean, man? Kurt. Ah, uh, look, Kurt, come on, man. What the fuck does that mean? Diddy situation. So y'all make sure you subscribe. Of course, I also want to thank you guys for watching today's video. But as you guys know, it's been your boy, the tan Superman. And some other viral news out here needs to be covered. So I'm out. Peace. Ain't that a bitch? The woman who robbed $1 billion. I want to introduce you to a woman who will surprise you. This woman is cunning, ruthless, brutal, easy to underestimate. And even though she's from a country that most of us can't place on a map, I think it's important we know her story. Uh, Johnny, is she, is she in prison still? I don't.
know if there's a satisfying story or answer or whatever here, but um, I'm going to document it. How the fuck do you even pronounce that damn country? You, wait, Uzbek, Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan. Okay. Like Uzbekistan, yeah, and that'd be. see if there is. And if you're watching this, that sometimes I gotta say it the proper way in the hood way. Uzbekistan and Uzbekistan. Okay, means that I found I something. Know. My very special guest is a visionary, very talented, politically oriented young lady. I call her the Princess of Uzbekistan. Pleasure to be with you tonight. One thing, don't use that idiotic line, dictator's daughter. I have a name, which is as simple as yours, Natalia. Natalia, Natalia, Natalia. Hi, how's it going? Hi. Oh my God, my background is a mess. You mind if I like quickly clean up behind me? Uh, do whatever you need to do, totally. I'm asking myself, why am I obsessed with this story that happened 10 years ago it's a good and... story because it's a tale like no other such a shakespearean yeah. tale having reported and having never had access and having all uh, to the to the people in power because they don't give you access it was just so surreal to suddenly get a twitter message from gulara karimova don't call me dictator's daughter i have a name just like you do natalia that message will always sort of stay with me i was fascinated by whatever the hell was going on there. The thing that I, I'm interested in talking to you about, do you remember how you perceived her all those years ago? I spent a lot of months looking into the princess of Uzbekistan, and I wouldn't be able to do that um, without sponsors. Yeah, so I'm going to quickly say I thank you to sponsor about sponsor today's really. video, which is I BetterHelp. Just want to know BetterHelp is a platform the that makes therapy this more accessible right to everyone. Because how you just steal down there a billion dollars? Therapy as a way of Uzbekistan. Okay. What the fuck is Uzbekistan? I would have started there. That's where I would have started. I ain't gonna lie. What the hell is this? The number one Karimova expert is Chris Laslet. Chris Laslet. Have you reached out to him? Hey Johnny, how you going? How you doing? Not bad, not bad. So Gulnara Karimova is the daughter of the eldest daughter, in fact, of Uzbekistan's first autocratic president. You hold up, fuck up, hold up, hold up, no. How you got the picture with the ops? You got the picture with yo. Okay. All right. I see you. I see you. You little neutral motherfucker. You have these newly formed independent states emerging out of the, the rubble of the Soviet Union with these newly minted leaders got one foot in the Soviet tradition and one foot into the future. Uzbekistan in the 90s. All these new states emerge out of the rubble. And then you have the children of that first generation of leaders. Born in the 1970s, so when the Soviet Union falls, she's in her 20s. You know, obviously they had extraordinarily powerful parents. Oldest daughter of Islam Karimov, the dictator of Uzbekistan. Her mom dictator, is an economist, God. Russian descent, currently has two children. She was one of the first from that sort of post-Soviet generation to go abroad, to immerse herself in both Western Europe and North America. Studies international econ in Uzbekistan. Goes to NYC, studies jewelry and fashion. It's a master's degree. Okay, then Wait, Harvard. Wait, the fuck though? How do you just study fucking jewelry and fashion? Who the fuck do that? Study jewelry and fashion. Bitch, you just went over there to go buy some shit. That's not what the fuck you did. 
Waddle, 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 waddle. Some, mm. okay, all right, okay. Why, so, why y'all do this shit, bro? Some of y'all, I ain't gonna say who, but y'all know who the fuck I'm talking about. Some, some niggas know what I'm talking about, but still, like, why, why make it seem like, nigga, this is, oh, yeah, I got a degree in, uh, say you, what the fuck it is, oh, I got a degree in content creation. Yeah, I major in content creation. Get the fuck out of here, sir. Ma'am. The fuck? That shit sounds stupid. Gets a PhD in really quick locations. Another I study fucking jewelry and fat. Sh shut up. Degree. This one in telecommunications. Damn. How many degrees does this woman have? She was far more than just the daughter of President Islam Karimov, you know, her father, who was an appalling dictator. She wasn't just a princess on the side of, of things. She was uh, a part of the system. And then she becomes the permanent representative for her country at the United Nations. It's kind of a big deal. It's like a huge post. A couple of years later, she becomes the ambassador to Spain. That speaks to a personality that's extremely driven, extremely ambitious. But at the same time, you know, from all those who I've spoken to, they also describe someone who was ruthless, who had um, visions of grandeur. You know, she began to intimate that she may indeed be the successor to her father as president of his back. Hold on, hold on. The word intimate right now can't, can't work right now. Okay, because first of all, the shit. Pakistan. Because, okay, first of all, look at this shit. All right. She's dressing as far that as like model. To a personality that's this has nothing to do with extremely ambitious. Like, but at the same time, some of it you know, is this, this, some of this shit. Like, driven, extremely ambitious. But at the same time, you know, not from like, all you those know what I'm saying? I've I mean, spoken to. You're not a celebrity. You are a politician, okay? That's not a word, but you're a politician, okay? And um, just like a damn politician. Like, I don't know. There's celebrity and then there's politician, bro. Suit, so, you know, you can well look. See, right there, right there, that she got on right here, this is definitely presentable. You feel what I'm saying? Um. And then she becomes the permanent rep post. Personality that's extremely... She becomes the ambassador to Spain. That Just speaks to a personality that's extremely driven, extremely ambitious. But at the same time, you know, from all those who I've spoken to, they also describe someone who was ruthless, who had um, visions of grandeur. You know, she began to intimate that she may indeed be the successor to her father as president of Uzbekistan. And that's the thing. I'm really glad that she's just trying to get out her pop shadow, trying to make her own look like, you know. Hopefully she don't, you know, turn around and then become as her father, you know. Uh, but at the same time, it just sounds good so far. And this is where I need to shift because my mind can't go any further unless I better understand Uzbekistan. See? Why the fuck you ain't start with what the hell is Uzbekistan? I told you. What the fuck is Yeah, there we go. First observation, Uzbekistan is beautiful. It's a super landlocked country, like it's double landlocked, meaning all of the countries that border it are also landlocked. There's only one other country in the world that has that situation, which is Liechtenstein, the micro state next to Switzerland. Wet keyboard alert, stop everything. Turn the keyboard off, dry it off. This unfortunately happens more often than I like to admit. This is a very closed regime. 
very unknown, very secretive. The security services, the, the, the Uzbek equivalent of the KGB, controlled a lot of the economy. Wait, very wait, 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 KGB, you say? Hold on, huh? This is a very closed regime very unknown, very secretive. The security services, the, the, the Uzbek equivalent of the KGB, controlled a oh, lot of the economy, very ruthless, Putin-esque type of characters. My perception of Golnar and the subsequent work that I did in Uzbekistan is really inseparable from, from horrendous, horrendous human rights violations that were happening at the country at the time. This is a government that shot its own people dead in the street when they were protesting. We're talking hundreds of people just mowed down the regime that used torture oh, systematic. That's crazy. That's crazy. Oh, fuck them. Oh, fuck them. Oh, fuck School ain't never teach me about no shit like this. This is crazy. <laughs> in detention, if, you know, no free media, no free speech, no free association, freedom of assembly, none of it. Okay, I want to get back to the princess here because that's what this story is about. But at least we have a foundation of what Uzbekistan is today. And that might help us understand what she gets up to next. How dare, how dare, how dare. Wow, this is wild. This is uh, Gulnara Karimova, and you're watching Fashion TV. Was that her? Was that her, like, singing and shit? Our princess Gulnara starts to do everything. She launches a jewelry line. We have a jewelry collection presenting today. You start to see her at all these fashion shows. She got a real thrill from having access to very powerful and important people. I, had, I think I was blessed to have a very good friends from like with artistic talents. She has pictures of herself in the background with the Clintons. It's, it's so organized. Well, I, I, I graduated from Harvard, so. <laughs> she launches a music career. Her stage name is so great. It's Gugusha. These are good names. Kind of gets a little bit of traction and like starts making these music videos that are pretty wild. I've been watching. And she writes a screenplay, famous actors to be a part of it. Movie premiere. Hold the fuck up. Cause that's what was it? Was it okay? Okay, okay, hold on. Because I think was it is it North Korea? Kim Jong Un, Kim Jong Il, Il Kim Jong Il. That motherfucker was doing the same kind of shit. That motherfucker was like a movie director, and he was getting all the like the propaganda and shit all throughout Korea and shit. I feel like it's North Korea. I, I feel like it is. They ain't them niggas. Hold on, hold on, hold on, because you know, nigga, want to say the wrong shit, get his head chopped off. See, I'm right. I knew I wasn't tripping. I knew I wasn't tripping. Damn, cuz. The crazy part is cuz, like, it was conceived in Russia. Jeez. But yeah, man, he was heavy in the movies with the propaganda and shit. So, wow. What? Okay, back to this. Cause that's crazy as hell. 
All she creates all these NGOs, charitable work in Uzbekistan. It was impossible to avoid Gugusha. Benefits and red carpets with the glitterati. She's got properties all around the world. She's just what doing the all right. Fuck? And crucially, there's even talk about her becoming the next leader of Uzbekistan, the heiress. And if that's the story, it might not be that interesting. But there's a lot more to it. I'm on WikiLeaks right now, and I'm looking at a document that shows us that Gulnara was up to a bunch of other things during this time that had nothing to do with pop music and jewelry design. I think the more obstacles you have, the more successful you are. You couldn't have a bigger contrast between the public face of this beautiful, glamorous, charming woman and the horror. Where's the movie on this bitch? People were telling about her. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> In some ways, for many people, she was the ultimate symbol of the injustice that was happening in Uzbekistan. So I love this cable. This cable is so useful for what we're trying to do here. While a lot of the world is seeing all of this, the American diplomats in Uzbekistan see through the facade. They say that there's this propaganda campaign happening in Uzbekistan, all of these articles being written about Gulnara. They focus on her selfless giving, her charitable work, her business acumen, and that she might even be the next president of the country. She's honest, hardworking. She's looking out for the best interests of her country. But then the diplomat says, all of this likely irks the many business people who have been crushed by her, by her greed. And then they say that actually, she's more like a robber baron. Pretty juicy quote by the State Department. Pretty spicy. Mm, she what is you mean? a greedy, power-hungry individual who uses her father to crush business people or anyone else who stands in her way. I will never forget talking to this businessman. He had visible signs of torture on his... Hold on, because if that's the case, this bitch walking around like she got down. This whole is a true porcelain doll, bro. Because you got to think about it. They, they come across as like, you know, sweet and angelic, right? But they made out of glass and they dolls and they damn near look human-like. That's creepy as a bitch. You feel me? Like, that's almost like... What the fuck? Yo, that's... That's oh, that's creepy, bro. Try to come across as this little pretty innocent thing, and then you just is devious, and you telling people, you know who the fuck my daddy is. I feel like that's what she doing. You don't think so? space from the time he spent in prison in Uzbekistan. And the only reason that he went through this insane torture in jail and that ruined his life uh, completely uh, and then led him to multiple suicide attempts long after he was, you know, out of prison. The only reason was Gulnara because Gulnara, he had ran a successful business and she wanted to take over and she made sure that she took over. And that is not what so so okay so she come across as goddamn that's funny she come across as like sofia figaro but she really griselda it's kind of funny i mean it's not funny but it's like damn because like you kind of play this you kind of come off as like this this you know this little pretty person but it's like god damn you're a, you're a petty pussy like you know what i'm saying like you you you're a weirdo like you uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, all dictators got some kind of, like, psychopath about them that I really don't like. I really don't like. Because it's always like, oh, maybe they were mentally going through something. Man, fuck out of here. They got to go. They got to go. What single story. That, that story was repeated again and again and again. <laughs> Each time you have an obstacle, you have an opportunity to think what is right and what is wrong, where is black and where is white. And you have a moment to decide what, uh, what's your next step.
in the early 2000s, she divorced her then husband, who came from a prominent family in Uzbekistan that ran lots of businesses, specifically in bottling, like with Coca-Cola. After the divorce, the ex-husband alleges that she used her personal bodyguards to beat him up and then used her power within the government to shut down or take over his family's businesses. Ah, oh, fuck this bitch. It's, all, it's, all, it's already fuck her, bro. This shit already went to like, wow, this is cool. She's amazing to like, man, fuck this lady, bro. Ah, uh, this this was fast. My my reaction changed fast. This is great. This is great. Wonderful. In the early two thousands, she divorced her then husband, who came from a prominent family in Uzbekistan that ran lots of businesses, specifically in bottling, like with Coca Cola. After the divorce, the ex husband alleges that she used her personal bodyguards to beat him up and then used her power within the government to shut down or take over his family's businesses. She immediately began a campaign to eviscerate the Maksudi family's joint venture stake in Coca-Cola. And uh, she did this by using the courts as her personal legal scissors to cut it up. They, she, he, he claims that Gunara could write court decisions and just give it to the judges who would then deliver it because they would have been afraid of what would have happened to them. She could get away with it because she was the, the daughter of, of the president and, and people were frightened of her. We have a proverb which says, what doesn't kill us always makes us stronger. No, ho, you out here killing people. You out here telling mother... Bro, you out here telling forward, do you know who my daddy is? My God, my God! See, boys, see, boys! It'll tell you about a little shoulders like this, boy. I'm telling you, man. I'm telling you, man. Just off rip. Soon as she be like, "Oh yeah, I like you," don't get to know you. Da 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 da. Who's your father? Who's your daddy? I mean, Pauls. But still, like, it be like, man, you don't know who he, bro. Even his daddy be something else. I'm telling you. And then on top of that, it just be like she got brothers. You don't know what they do. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. This bitch just flipped the script on me. Jesus. Flip the script. The firm paid $220 million to an offshore company secretly controlled by Gulnara Karimova, the daughter of the then president of Uzbekistan. United States District Court, Southern District of New York. United States of America versus Gulnara Karimova and Behsad Ahmedov. Count one, conspiracy to violate the Foreign Corruption Practices Act. The defendants engaged in an extensive corrupt bribery scheme in which Karinova demanded to pay hundreds of millions of dollars in bribes. Karinova solicited and facilitated corrupt bribe payments from the three telecommunication companies and their subsidiaries to shell companies controlled by Karinova, who at the time was an Uzbek government official. In exchange for the bribes, Karinova corruptly used her influence over the Uzbek government to ensure that the three telecommunication companies and their subsidiaries acquired telecommunication licenses, which under Uzbek law could not be purchased or transferred by private entities. In total, Ahmedov and others conspired to make approximately $866 million in corrupt bribe payments to Karinova. There was a very, very, very dark side to her. Karinova conspired with others to launder the bribed funds from and through bank accounts in the United States in order to promote the ongoing bribery scheme and conceal the proceeds in that scheme. From 2001 to 2012, Ahmedov conspired with others to pay more than $420 million of bribes to Karimova. Many hundreds of millions flowed into her bank accounts. Bribes would be distributed through different commercial camouflage. Karimova caused numerous payments to be made and laundered through multiple bank accounts held in the names of shell companies. The receipt of a telecommunications license and other government benefits in Uzbekistan. Associate A, a representative in an American company, met with Karinova in in Dubai. At the meeting, Karinova threatened to cause problems if they did not give her 20% stake in their business for no cost. On July 20th. God damn. Hey. Oh, 
Who? <laughs> Who this bitch? Oh my goodness. This woman here. This <laughs> shit. I'm, I'm gonna tell you this, man. Uh, oh my a woman who can move eight hundred and how much he say? 844 million? This bitch is able to get that much money sent to her based on, hey, you you going to give me some stakes because you know who my daddy is. We'll, 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 that, you know, we'll da 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 We'll do what we got to do to you. You know what I'm saying? Like, damn. 29th, 2004, MTS transferred approximately $100 million. August 2004, the escrow agent transferred the approximately $100 million bribe. February 2008, Karimova sought additional bribes from MTS to pay an additional $30 million in bribes to Karimova. What do you want to do with all this money? The property known as the Gorse Hill Manor. Look at this gorgeous house that she bought. 17 acres of garden. Indoor swimming pool. Jacuzzi as well as a lake. Just what the fuck did you do for any of them damn company? Not a goddamn thing. She ain't do nothing for these companies. She's just I told you. She told they ass, hey, do you know who my dad is? Checking in to tell you that. <clears throat> oh god. Yeah. I haven't spoken in a moment. Um, I'm deep in it now. And I'm in that point where the next section of the story like what happens like the beginning of this downfall is infinitely more complicated than i was prepared for harimova used other individuals to act as nominee owners and shareholders of shell company c eight market muse in london an offshore company affiliated with 30 million dollars and approximately 14 payments totaling 10.5 million viplecom subsidiary transferred 20 million dollars 331 million dollars in bribes to karimova in exchange for karimova exercising her influence scooping up everything oil gas telecommunications logistics, manufacturing, industry, agriculture, drug trafficking, and illicit enterprises. $9.2 million, $5 million, $80 million, $15 million. She didn't just run one thing. She had her fingers all over the place. She was building a big empire. Where's the movie? Where the fuck is the movie? Because this hall is able to rob everybody. Not even just everybody. Okay, here's the thing. Okay, she didn't just rob everybody. It's just the fact of these damn telecommunication companies and shit became smaller and smaller companies, if I'm not mistaken. This. And she had people sitting there in order to collect this money, and then she was collecting the money from these people. That was like, come on, fake businesses pretty much. And it's, fuck! Where is the movie? The picture that all of this paints is that Gulnara Karimova, during this time that we see her being this like fashion icon and this music star, is actually during this whole time involved in a massive fraud and corruption scheme that. <laughs> basically traverses the whole world in the middle of the early 2000s she did some telecommunications degree or something right as she's getting her bachelor of arts in telecommunications she's also we know now deeply involved in a giant corruption scheme where she is receiving money from companies in order to give them the licenses to build telecommunication oh, stuff bro. in uzbekistan It's 2012. Gulnara has built this massive corruption network around the world. She's taking in tons of bribes through all of these shell companies. She's using all of these ill-gotten gains to buy really nice homes in England and elsewhere. She's continuing her image as a fashion and music icon. But this is where she starts to make some pretty big errors. We can, I think, pretty definitively say that she overstepped whatever uh, whatever lines that they were. She was stepping on, on people's toes. 
she was making some very powerful people angry. A very notorious uh, character called Rustami Nayatov, who was very close to Gulnara's father. And those powerful people were foremost in the security services, and the security services are former KGB people, and they have very strong links to the Kremlin. She pissed him off, clearly, and he made sure that she was punished. They can see that she's expanding and expanding like the universe, and it's a zero-sum game. The more she expands, the less they have. It's the king and the king's court. People on the inside are allowed to enrich themselves and play their own games, and everyone else is just, you know, a stage for the games that they play. The head of the SNB and SNB generals do not like her. So if you begin to take on the security services in Uzbekistan, you also take on the Kremlin. And that is a very difficult thing to do and a very unwise thing to do. They were getting muscled out by this young, arrogant upstart. She was not easy pickings for them to outmaneuver her. Meanwhile, Gunara's dad is getting old and mm. there's a big question of succession. So they're seeing these very clear hints of her political ambitions. So she's made enemies with the head of the SNB, who is connected to the FSB in Russia. This is where we see the engineering of Gulnara's downfall, the outmaneuvering, which begins with Gulnara's right-hand man. We saw him back in the DOJ indictment. His name is Beksad Akhmedov. He was a young entrepreneurial telecommunications mind who was an expert in the industry expert in how, oh. to do, uh, how to run the telecommunications whole time he probably wouldn't default i mean you know let's just keep it a bean he he looked about around the same age as her he wanted to get down that's what that looked like that's all you know he ain't getting on so you know you've been hating ever since i don't know that's just what it's giving me bro communications and so it was a perfect person to manage her interests okay so akhmedov is like a key figure in this corruption scheme he holds a lot of her secrets probably what made karamova's rise so so quick was her ambition she was clever she was also quite ruthless to her own people and they were afraid of her and here i'm talking specifically of Bek akhmedov he was under a constant fear that he was going to be arrested by karamova and put in prison and suffer a fate um similar to other people who who had crossed her or had been perceived to have crossed her i think he had a young family he was terrified Akhmedov then flees to Russia with all of Gulnara's secrets. And this is where we get to a point that we don't know exactly what happens next. It gets fuzzy because we don't have solid evidence. But the sources I talked to piece together a circumstantial story that implies that Akhmedov gave these secrets to the FSB in Russia or someone else in Russia who was aligned with the SMB in Uzbekistan, these enemies of Gulnara. And they then took those secrets and gave them to a Swedish news outlet who conducted a thorough investigation into this corruption scheme. They found witnesses within the companies and then they told the world. Telia was prosecuted over a corrupt telecoms deal. The firm paid $220 million to an offshore company secretly controlled by Gulnara Karimova, the daughter of the then president of Uzbekistan. The American authorities described it as a $220 million bribe. The president was accused of receiving from Western telecommunications companies, about a million dollars. So, the gig's up for Gulnara. But she doesn't stop there. Obviously, I was fascinated by whatever the hell was going on there because and it all unraveled as a totally Shakespearean drama. Gulnara's social media quickly turns from promoting her fashion career and posting photos of her doing yoga poses to erratic, paranoid ramblings aimed at her enemies. Threatening to reveal all the sturdy secrets of the top brass of the country. She was dangerous during that time. Tension is growing everywhere. Going home to my father, my path was blocked, she says. She says her dad is being controlled by the SMB, that her mom sold out. And then she accuses her mom and her sister of turning on her, accusing them of witchcraft. She starts using the hashtag SMB thieves 
continuing to call out the head of the... Hold the fuck up. Y'all still claiming witchcraft and motherfucking, what is it, 2013, some shit? SMB specifically, the likely architect of her downfall. And she decided to go against them by essentially accusing them of everything that we journalists have long been reporting on. The human rights abuses, corruption, you know, all this like horrible things that were happening in Uzbekistan at the same time and this she, she was very much part of so she was a loose cannon and that that almost certainly was another pillar of her downfall and then she starts tweeting at human rights activists and journalists then she got in touch with me to protect her if I could do that because her rights were being abused and suddenly human rights became very important for her when it was her own rights that were threatened. She was suddenly positioning herself as someone who was concerned with transparency and media freedom and all these things. But this isn't working. She's just digging herself deeper and deeper. And in fact, all of this tweeting gives her enemies in the security services the ammo they need to deal the final blow. A detailed portfolio of evidence was given to President Karamov outlining all the activities of his daughter and the serious impact that it's had on the, the reputation of Uzbekistan. And as a result of that, his blessing was given. And she just crossed one too many people one too many times and, and then that's it, and down came, down came the ax. And then she vanished. Everyone's like, what's happened to Gulnara? Oh, shit. One day, I get a message, and basically it was a handwritten letter from her in which she described being under a house arrest and the fact that she could no longer access her father and how she was the prisoner of the, um, this part of the Uzbek elite. We are held in the house and uh, basically we can't step outside. We kept in the conditions worse than dogs. Why do you think she chose to communicate with you? What was she hoping you would do? What she wanted was publicity, uh, clearly. What she wanted was, uh, I think she wanted, she wanted to win, winning this weird power struggle. <laughs> That's why she got in touch. Uh, she was she was fighting for survival, and she was, you know, using me to do that. You know, it's this astronomical rise, and then this rapid downfall. You know, and and it's very much like that last sequence in Goodfellas, where where it suddenly all unravels, and like there are helicopters overhead, and there's like you know, and 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 that's exactly kind of what happened. Last question here: What do you think her story can teach us about Uzbekistan generally as a, as a country and as a regime? I really think that these days, when we truly live in a globalized world, and there are lots and lots of pandemics of different sorts happening all the time, there are lots of viruses, and they don't have to be infectious diseases, right? They are corruption, they are uh, oligarchy, they are authoritarian systems that spread in ways that we might not be noticing and they are often born in places that we're not paying attention to. We wouldn't have Gulnara and we wouldn't have that regime in Uzbekistan benefiting and enriching itself so much if it hadn't been the systems that were put in place in, in countries like the United Kingdom that have allowed oligarchs and foreign thieves to prosper and use their systems. We need to be aware how the tools that we built to make our lives better are then used and abused and are subsequently used against us. It is really important to pay attention to places that may be off radar because what happens there often comes and haunts us in our own communities far away. I said to myself, let me see who I am. Even all these critical things, just to take it through and to see if, if this is the reality, let me face the reality. Yeah, sorry. Damn. To be on top of the world and then just fall off, just like that is... 
Mm. But you know, she she fought a hard fight. That's all I can really say. Cause damn the Brob the Brob companies to pay you money. And all you gotta say is <laughs> Boy, do you know who my father is? That shit is crazy, man. You'll watch that later. Okay. That boy Gene Gene Dill know everything about Diddy. That shit get that shit about to get hectic. Mm hmm. That's crazy. Well, folks, my birthday tomorrow. I'm excited. Turn two seven, man. I'm happy about it, man. Yeah. But nah, I ain't gonna lie, man. Y'all be easy, bro. I appreciate y'all, man, for chilling with Cuzzo, dog. Y'all have a good night.